This uh, conference afternoon. will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everybody. So, yes, I, I'm Mick Matthews. Um, I'm program engineer for the South Rail Systems Alliance. Uh, I've basically been with Network Rail for the best part of 19 years now, um, and most of that time has primarily been spent in the world of track renewals, um, high output, plain line, and S and C. And I've um, been fortunate enough to work pretty much all over the country with the North Alliance, the South Alliance, and the plain line teams. Uh, before joining the um, railways, I spent um, a couple of years at Honda UK Manufacturing, and before that, I was a um, uh, ground support engineer in the Royal Air Force for 13 years. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, and I'm here today to talk about the, um, some of the development work uh, we've been doing on the alliances and myself to actually um, get a modern day solution for reballasting, um, primarily S and C, but just just reballasting. Um, so. Um, what is it? What, what do we currently have? Um, yeah, and uh, what's good about what we currently have, and what's not so good? So uh, we got train board. So we have got like um, the train board excavators, which you can see in the picture, picture there. Um, these have a really, really good excavation rate. Um, what makes a good such an excavator is a high-powered fan unit, and they certainly have a high-powered fan unit. Um, they also have a great advantage that they get directly to the point of work. Um, they're, they're rail mounted and they'll get to exactly where you need to be. But I suppose um, you could argue a disadvantage about that is they're tied to train paths. So utilisation becomes quite difficult um, as you're trying to move them around the network. They have um, every um, suction activator needs some form of hopper to receive the ballast. And yeah, the, um, the train board systems have quite a healthy hopper on them. When that hopper's full, we have to stop and we have to go and discharge that hopper somewhere. Um, so all that time, we've got no excavation going on, so it's not continuous. And then the other problem with that is the spoiled ballast, when we drop, drop the hopper to the side of the track, we then have to get another machine in to double handle that spoiled ballast into an engineering train or to an awaiting lorry at the roadside. So there's an awful lot of double handling to be done there. But yeah, as a piece of equipment, um, an absolutely excellent piece of equipment, really, really good production rate. We then can have a look at um, the lorry mounted things. Now, pretty much the lorry mounted um, systems aren't a great deal of difference to the train mounted system, apart from ones on rail and ones on road wheels. So again, similar sort of excellent excavation rate, similar sort of power of suction, um, probably not quite the same size hopper as a train, but not far off it. Um, I suppose the advantage is there you could have several lorries lined up in convoy, and as one fills up, the other one keeps going again, but that could prove expensive. Um, but again, um, double handling is spoiled. The, these lorries still need to discharge their hopper somewhere, and at some point we have to handle and deal with that spoil. And probably more important than anything else, you need a basically a haul road adjacent to the line. And um, yep. Yeah, in quite a bit few places of SNC we have that, but on the whole, not really, not really. We don't really normally have that. And then the final one in our sort of suction arsenal is the RRV attachments. Um, but these are literally very, very limited. You know, maybe maybe digging out some foundations or something like that, or maybe clearing the um, clearing the track for some cables, but very, very limited hopper capacity. Yeah, you know, you'll get probably two or three minutes of excavation out of these things tops. Lots of double handling. Um, but again, because it's an RRV, you get to the point of work fairly, fairly quickly, fairly easily. And to be honest, um, from a cost point of view, very, very cheap. But is it is it what we need for rebalancing S and C? And um and and just going on, I'll just leave you to sort of ponder that for. I'm not here to tell you, I'm just here to promote a conversation. So the other system then is the, uh, the gender gopher. So, uh, and again, you could argue the picture in the top right hand corner of the gopher is an RRV. Well, it is an RRV, but is it a super RRV? So, um, so the under covers, um, there's, uh, there's a few out there um, um, existing, but a lot of them were built in the 60s and 70s. Yes, some of them had some refurbishments like the stove art stuff, but they're fundamentally quite an old piece of kit. And in my opinion, very, very underpowered for what we're trying to achieve with them. Um, 
especially with some of the more heavier concrete layouts we have now. They, 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 they're, they're slow, in my view, they're slow. Uh, we can then go to the sort of almost the on-track machine axis, and there's a picture there, the um, Placid URM 700. Um, I was fortunate enough to go out to see Austria, uh, to Austria and see this in action. Um, again, now this is this is an excellent bit of kit. Um, um, we'll support a whole SMC unit underneath it. It will um, an amazing excavation rate. It's a cut of our system, um, but it's continuous because it's basically feeding to spoil trained MFSs in front of it and it's taking new spoil in behind it and it can also clean the ballast so it uh, recycles at the same time um, but the, the big big problem with this is the capital costs and the operational costs of this if anybody who's had any experience of ballast cleaning or high app or anything like that the the, the work done a couple of hours in an eight hour possession is only only a, a fraction of the actual support the logistics behind these machines. If you look at high output, there's massive cubes, there's an all day logistic chains, they're very, very expensive. And again, the uh, final one then is again back to the RRB attachments. We have an undercut of bar which can go on the end of an RRB boom. But again, um, yeah, they're, they're literally doing nothing more than cutting the bias from underneath the track and you need to do something about it. But the advantage of the undercut as opposed to the suction excavators is the cut you get. You get like a dozer-like finish underneath the track. So you're going to put a cross fall on there, get a very nice flat level or uh, graded track bed, um, which is a definite advantage. So this is sort of what we have. So if we're going to try and make improvements, what 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 is it we need to do to try and make some improvements? And the, so we put together what uh, a set of user requirements. And again, I'm, I'm open to feedback, I'm open to challenging these. And in fact, I'd really like you at the end to maybe add to these. Um, so I think from an asset point of view, we really want that dozer like finish up on the track bed. So we get a nice level, flat, graded track bed. From a safety point of view, we want to keep staff at the dig. These cutter bars are lethal or the suction excavators they're yeah, they're still connected to hydraulics we don't want the staff being struck by it but also um, ask yourself the question do we really want the staff working under a suspended load and when you think about a track system when we take the ballast out that's exactly what that track system is it's a suspended load we wouldn't have allow people to work under load suspended by an rrv or a train so why do we allow it for rebalancing um, i want to be able to reduce the emissions now there's the noise emissions. A lot of these machines are very, very noisy due to the, um, just the sheer noise of excavation for the noise of the diesel engines, but also we create an awful lot of dust and um, it's the emissions and noise. We'd like to be able to reduce them. Uh, we've got to think about our neighbours, our line side neighbours and the welfare of our workforce. Um, double handling. Double handling um, costs. Every time we do something twice, it's basically twice as expensive and takes twice as long. So whatever system we want to put in place, we ideally want to eliminate the double handling associated with the previous systems. Uh, S&T disconnections and OLE disconnections, stuff like that. Again, time consuming, can prove quite expensive. So if we get away with those, that would be a good user requirement to have. Um, back to the um, dozer light finish, good track quality. The reason we're doing these refurbishments, these balance renewal, is to actually um, stop the stop, stop the degradation of the track and hopefully improve the track quality. So that's got to be a tick, tick in the box. Um, clearly, these have got to be affordable. Um, we, we, we're constrained by budget, so if we're doing a refurb which we're rebalancing, whatever solution we throw at it has to be affordable. It has to be right. Um, again, continuous excavation. Um, at the moment in time, um, the undercut has given us nice continuous excavation, but the suction machines can't. The suction machines, once their hopper's full, they have to stop and they have to discharge their load. And that means we stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. So when we're talking about short access periods, this really is problematic. So if we can have a system which has continuous excavation, that's brilliant. Obviously, they, uh, probably double handling, but 
we want these chain, we want these machines, whatever they are, to be able to discharge straight into a, a, a wagon on the adjacent line or a trailer on the adjacent line. And we don't have to worry about um, handling the spoil straight into an engineering train, it's off the site. Um, opening speeds. Traditionally, after refurbishment, especially SMC, we look towards a 20 mile an hour opening speed. Is there something we can do to actually give this 50 miles an hour, which is more traditional, uh, more traditional TSR associated with um, flat renewals? Or can we actually get 80 miles an hour? Can we get line speed? What is it? What is it? This system needs to do to enable that. And then there's some of the other things which our RAM clients are particularly keen on, and rightly so. Can we put a geotextile down while we're in the cutting or um, excavating? Can we apply a cross fault? Can the ballast be recycled, keeping costs down and actually, you know, rather than using new ballast from quarries all the time, can we recycle that? Can we put an element of that return ballast back in the hole? Of course, we need to improve the safety of the whole thing altogether. And more importantly, is whatever we put out there, we must be able to. Um, I was just on a spelling mistake, but sorry about that. We must be able to get that deployed or packed away within about a 30 minute time period. That's on and off tracking, ready ready to work. If we go much further than that, we just don't have enough time in the short midweek sessions to be able to work it. So that's what I think. Um, these are my requirements for a super RRV for the So let's have a look at what we've done. So the first system, let's have a look at um, the force one continuous suction excavator which we've developed. So where where did we go? Oh, probably about four or five years ago now, a company called Fortwood approached us and they came to see us with this little Brock system here, which we said, that's an interesting concept, guys. Let's give it a bash. So we went up to Grange Sidings, they put their Brock on the track and they connected the um, suction excavator and we excavated a few um, ballast beds. And that was great. So um, the likes of myself, big Adrian Everson is a member. We sat down then with Portsmouth and said, look guys, we get what you're doing. We like what you're doing, but we, we, we really want you to think about what we want and what we need to achieve. And we shared with them the user requirements. And then we also, but we also bear in mind, we weren't putting any money into this. This is all totally and utterly self-funded by Force One. So we have to build some trust. So the first thing we did and um, I think Adrian and Martin Davis will be this. I'm going to show you a video of what the first step we did. And this is this is that filter. Nick, we've got a few questions regarding the sound of the video. Uh, sorry, Jules. Uh, sorry, Jules. Yeah, there's a question regarding the sound of the videos. Oh, I was hearing it. Were you not hearing it? No. Oh, okay. Well, I do apologise. Um, what I do, um, 
I'm not, I don't know why you can't hear the sound because I'm hearing it myself. But um, what I'll do, I'll, I'll do some commentary over the videos. Anyway, um, so where I was um, that? That was basically so we took the Brock and you know we made it into an RRV by sticking on the rail trailer, trailer, and we, we you know we had some success, but we knew it wasn't what we needed. So we then spoke to the forceman and said, "What you need to do is take that and mount it on the end of an RRV, and that's this system here." Um, and, and again, bear in mind this is private money. So what they did straight away was to say, okay, we'll mount it on an RRV for you, Nick, but we're not going to invest in the other stuff, such as the continuous excavation and the hopper system, until we are satisfied that we can make this work. I'll show you a video of this in a minute. So this took quite a quite a leap. So not only do we have to put the 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 suction head onto an RRV. We also, working with Goss Engineering, which is a company in Wales, has to fully remote control an RRV. So this man here can control this RRV in its entirety from its remote control. So just going to show you a video and we'll have a look at that working. So, um, as you can see, we now got quite a, an articulate machine, such an excavator, actually clearing out the um, the, the um, cribs quite nicely there. And um, they're very articulate, can move around quite a lot, very agile. And it's doing a really, really good job. But uh, you probably can see there's a, a, a lorry here. The second that lorry is full, we have to stop working. And pretty much any second now, about four or five beds, that lorry hopper is pretty much full. So that, that, that's the portion of excavator. So the next stage then was to work with force one and then meet some more of the user requirements. So we now had an RRV mounted suction excavator, which is great. Um, but we then needed to make it continuous. So how do you how do you make it continuous? And how do you make it strong enough? How do you make it a really powerful sucker? So the first thing you need is a really, really powerful fan unit. So this is a four-stage fan fan unit, the most powerful one on the market. And that just went to a single hopper, which discharge, which again still still once full has to discharge. We then went to a double hopper system, which I'll show you in the video. And the beauty about the double hopper system is as one hopper's full, the other one is discharging, and it just simply switches over, and that now gives us 100% continuous suction. So I'll just um, show, talk you for the system. So first of all, as I say, this is a full fan unit. We have a hopper system with dust suppression, you can see there, so that controls some of the emissions. And obviously we have the um, diesel 170 excavator, which is basically just hauling the whole thing and offering the boom to mount the header. So again, as I say, um, the four fan suction system, I'm assured that this is the most powerful four fan suction system in the UK. So it's more powerful than the rail mounted systems, um, 70 year old great horsepower V8 engine. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a beast, um, but it's mounted in ISO twist locks. So providing we've got um, you know, a little bit of a maneuverability and access point where we can get a, um, a rough terrain forklift, we can get that on and off track quite easily. Uh, the ballast hopper, this is quite a good one again, on ISO twist lock, so it just goes in a rail container, but it has got a twin hopper. So as one hopper's filled, the other one is discharging, and you'll see in the video in a minute that literally it takes about two seconds, three seconds, just to transfer from one hopper to the other. So we can keep the continuous excavation going. And of course, a lot of yeah, conveyor belts create a lot of dust. So this is now fully suppressed with um, the Airborne 10 dust suppression system, which will control our dust emissions. So, and again, as I said before, they, they come here as a package. They come along with their big, um, big um, Manitou uh, roll terrain forklift, so they can, you know, they can really move stuff around. And get it on track. So we um, had the system we developed, we've done it all now, and we typically use it at Worcester Parkway. So I'm just going to show you a video on that.
Again, so you can see the system working now. This is a um, Worcester, 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 Worcester Shrub Hill, um, obviously very, very contaminated. Very, very contaminated and ballast there. So it's just taking that out. The um, teams are following it behind better than the SEC. And it was very, very successful. And sorry about the um, video feed. I'm not quite sure what's going on. And there, there, there's the um, system which basically just transfers the hopper from one to the other, so that, that allows for continuous excavation. Yeah, you see the dust suppression system dampening down the dust carrying the engineering train, controlling all emissions. And from a sort of diesel emission point of view, these are all, all your cap seven systems, so they, they're basically infected with the air coming out of them is pretty much cleaner than the air going into them. So, so that's the Force One system we developed. So, um, you know, Force One have worked with us. They work with all the alliances, and they've developed this system. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. They they bankroll this themselves, but they've worked very much in conjunction with ourselves, listening to what our needs are to develop the system we require for our refurbishments. Um, and hopefully, you know, they're taking the gamble that we'll give them the works to support these machines going forward. So. When I look at the user requirements, then um, what I said at the start, how 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 have, how have we done with this option excavator? Um, well, we certainly don't get a dozer like finish. We know that from excavators. Um, we definitely can keep stuff out of the dig, um, basically because the, the track will support itself to about six beds before sagging, and we get the ballast in quite quickly. Have we reduced emissions? Yeah, well, the, the engine is not quite that; it's a, a fairly quiet engine. But we've definitely reduced the amount of dust we're emitting to the environment. We eliminated double handling. Uh, the beauty about the suction excavator, we can really have no disconnections. We can leave the POE and stuff in place and we can work around it. Track quality, good track quality. I put an X there only on the fact that um, we've had experiences of a place like Welling Garden City using suction excavators where the, we, we hand the track back to traffic. We've actually handed back at 80 miles an hour with a suction excavator. And the track quality has been absolutely amazing, but it hasn't held up. And we don't really know what's causing that, but not getting that ballast memory out, um, leaving an, an, you know, a uh, sort of not a very smooth formation and stuff like that, all adds to that. Affordable, or well, absolutely, compared to um, a train borne system, very affordable. It's a continuous excavation we want, so we're at high productivity. We can discharge an engineering train, brilliant. Um, 50 mile an hour open speeds, absolutely, but that's not so much the RRV, it's the rest of the system we put around it, and I'll speak about that later. We could lay a geotextile. Um, personally, I wouldn't recommend it, but it can be done. We could technically apply a cross fall, but I think because it is an excavator, we're probably pushing what we can realistically expect from it. So it's a suction excavator, we're pushing the boundaries there. Um, can we recycle the ballast? Well, not directly, but if it's going to an engineering train, it can be done at, um, uh, can be done at a, a yard. So we could potentially recycle the ballast, but not at the point of work. Improved safety, you can see it's a fully automated machine. And yes, we can get that on track within 30 minutes and break it down. So we've done a good job there, I think. Um, so then moving on, the next one, now this really is a super RRV, is the uh, railability or AP webs. Ballast undercutter. Now we we haven't had quite the same level of involvement in this, other than that um, Webs and Railability, who make the plant for AP Webs, realise that we have a hole we, we wouldn't do refurbish the SNC, and they've gone out and built a custom built RRV from the ground up. And this is why I call it a super RRV. It's not a converted excavator. It is custom built from top to bottom. And I count the um, Force One as a super RRV because it's no longer ever going to be used as an excavator or lifting machine. Its sole, solely designed purpose is to excavate fallacies and such. So this is the um, this is the availability machine. So 
Um, I'll, I'll play the video and I'll try and talk to you for the video, but it, it's fairly self-explanatory. So this is a great side, and as you see, it's quite a, quite a beast of a machine. But it's um it's agile; it can move on its own power. It's on tracks, so using the um, Web's UTAS system, Universal Track Access system, that's like the orange ring, we can quite comfortably get it on and off track. The way Web's allowed like to operate this is to put a full package around it, so it's their operators operating it um, for all the students. So the first thing we do is deploy the undercut to one side, get everything out, and then um, we, we see the trenching reel here, we'll cut a trench for the cut of bar to go into. And as you say, it's got a big depth of 450 millimetres below you sleep at the bottom. Uh, in time, this will have a full dust suppression system, but uh, when this video is taken, we're, we're, we're still developing the system. Um, as you can see, it discharges directly to an engineering train, either on directly behind to MFS type wagons or to the adjacent line. Um, the undercutter is fully guarded, um, absolutely. One of, the, one of the reasons I've been delaying this is with the velocity of the cutter bar, um, we worked out that, that we could have stones flying around at 90 miles an hour. So we have to fully, the webs have to fully close and guard the cutter bar, um, which again is a massive safety improvement. And as you see, it does what it says on the tin, it's basically just undercuts and it, it works at quite quite a rate. Um, obviously, you back fill the hole from the adjacent line, I've used an engineering train or uh, a clamshell such as that, or you could follow through an MSS in the full web hand, ballast handling system, various ways of getting the ballast back in the hole. And the other thing in webs that we've been working on webs is how can we get that all important compaction into the balance, that consolidation? And they come up with an elephant foot attachment to go into the end of an RRV. Uh, we put this in, we tried to drain sidings, and um, yeah, we really managed to get some good compaction underneath the sleepers. And what we did later on was actually to flood the track up to rail level and then compact down. And that really does give a nice stable base, um, which will support some uh, high speed only. And again, you can now see it simply off tracking itself. And again, this process, the on and off tracking process, is around about a 30 minute process to stow everything away and get it off track. So that's the uh, web's undercutter. And then we'll go back to our presentation. So you can see the web's undercutter. So again, let's have a look at the um, game. Are the user requirements I set out and how the how the web system or the availability system meets those. So pretty much um, ticks across the board. Yeah, we've got a doze light finish to the undercutter. Um, as you see, there's no staff in the dig, it's totally guarded. Um, we will have just suppression on both the cutter bar and um, the conveyors. And again, modern day diesel engines, a uh, lot less noisy, however, um, any sort of undercutting is still a noisy thing because you're basically uh, mining ballast. Eliminates the double handling, um, discharges straight to an engineering train. Uh, disconnections, yeah, it's an undercutter. Anything in its way, it will cut, it will destroy. So you will have to do single and disconnections. Um, so you can see that as a negative, but it, it's just if you want a good Sometimes you have to give to take a little. If you want a good those light finish and good track quality, you're going to have to um, um, take, a, take on disconnections. So good track quality, yes. Um, we can get a those light finish graded at the bottom and we can get some good compaction in there. Affordable, um, I would say affordable. Um, I'd imagine the shift rates are going to come in similar to what the Force One system is, maybe a little bit more, because it's a bit more specialist. Um, 
but it's definitely going to be a damn sight cheaper than a, a, a rail bore equivalent. Uh, as you see, continuous excavation, once it starts cutting, it continues to cut, much like a ballast cleaner. Discharges are engineering trains. Um, opening speeds, we'll move on to that, but yep, on 50 miles an hour, even greater is more than achievable. We can lay a geotextile. Um, one of the things we're going to work with webs is just to work out how we can put a geotextile roll underneath it, so it just rolls as it cuts. We're going to apply a crossfall. We can't recycle the ballast unless we could go back to a, a yard, but again, because it's an engineering train, we could create the ballast there. Massively improved safety. You see the guarding. There's no work force in the hole, that's good. And we have the 30 minute setup and break up. So, yeah, so um, from the user requirements I set out initially, we're doing a good job. But I think what you'll see comparing the two systems is they each, each have their purpose in life. For me, I think the undercover system, like the web system, that's what we should be throwing at our concrete layout to get the ballast in and out. I think the Force One system is probably more. The, what we use at Worcester for, that's our wooden layouts, which probably wouldn't take them the cutting, but actually we just know that getting some fresh ballast in there will extend that asset life. And I think the other thing we can think about as well with the suction excavators is not just re-ballasting, but things like UTXs, signal bases, um, um, cable chopping routes and stuff like that, that it, that it has a lot of uses more than just re-ballasting the SNC in plain line. So we'll talk a little bit about um, compaction and opening speed. So one of the problems with refurbs, um, especially with S and C, is how do we get that balance compacted? How can we ensure that that track's going to the geometrical position um, position of that track's going to hold up? And that's all about compaction. So um, traditionally, we do sort of the refurbishment. Be very, very cautious with a 20 mile handbag speed and um, tamp and tamp and get some traffic over it. Um, I think we can do a little bit better than that personally. Um, even as simple as the um, vertical tampers there, if the guys are working with the cutter bar, they can get some good consolidation in the ballast as we work. But then systems like the web's elephant foot system, which we can work directly behind, and as I said, we've flooded the ballast there and got some good compaction, that's going to help us. But then we've got the, these like mini tamper systems. So this is the um, the, the Robel mini tamper, which is good. And this is the Goss jacket tamper. And the good thing about the Goss jack, um, jack tamper, not only is it a conventional tamper, we can also put pads on it so we can actually consolidate the crib ballast as well. So there's all these things we can do. And then ultimately, there's the ultimate, which is the um, new 094S DTS tampers. So we can get really good consolidation, really good compaction in our s &C. So in my view, you know, we could say we're doing a, a refurbishment of a crossover midweeks nights, we could have say four nights supported by these sort of cost machines and have all these mobile machines or even the elephant foots and maybe look at a 20 mile hour hand back, even maybe a 50 mile hour hand back. And then on the final night of it, we come through with the, the big boy with the DCS on it, and, and yeah, we could get a line speed hand back quite easily, or at least an 80 mile hand back quite easily. And as I said, at Welling Garden City, using the rail care suction excavator, um, the mobile vertical tampers, and the DCS, we did hand back at 80 miles an hour. And the track was held up quite well, but just over time, over two or three months, the track quality did deteriorate, but it also deteriorated on the line where we didn't hand back at high speeds. But that was more to do with what we were doing, what the treatment was, what the condition asset was, rather than the equipment we threw at it. And then finally, it, how, how, how do we treat refurbishments? Um, how, how do we contract? How do we get people to do it without costing an absolute arm and a leg? So this is just my thoughts. And this is a system I put in place up in Scotland with the root asset team up there. And I call it a tri-party refurbishment. So when we think about it, the refurbishment is a is, is, is three parties. You have the, the, asset, the asset managers, who asset it is. You have the maintainer, who maintains the asset, the asset manager. And then you have the renewals company, the contractors, the alliances, who actually will come in and do the, the heavy duty work as and when required. So traditionally with a, a refurbishment, um, the 
the maintenance engineer will flag up to your asset manager saying, this track is getting past its maintenance limits, not a lot I can do about it, we need to do something about it. The asset manager then will say, well, yeah, it needs a renewal, or actually can't quite afford a renewal, or actually we can extend the life and do refurbishment. We then go, we, we then turn around to someone like the Alliance, and they say, okay, can you do this, guys? And then we apply pretty much the asset management policy, how we would do a full blown renewal. And that sets some expectations. So we'll do the refurbishment, but the refurbishment is not a renewal, and therefore the quality, the longevity, and some of the stuff you see out of traditional renewal aren't there. So we'll go back to try and hand it back to our maintenance colleagues, and they'll say, well, the track quality is no good, it's satisfactory, it's not blah, 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 and we get stuck. Um, where actually I think a far better way of dealing with this is to get the three parties to have an agreement. And that is a tripartite agreement. So basically the, 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 the maintainer still informs the asset manager that some work needs doing, the three parties then have a, a tri-party walkout and we walk through there using the appropriate tech board and we agree a bill of quantities. What is it we you want the lines or the track renewal team or the work delivery team to do? And if it is a rebalance, that's fine. We can then go away, we can calculate a price and we can send the price that back to the RAM. And the RAM can say, yep, I can afford that or actually can't afford that. Can you take some elements off? But the important thing is we agree with the RAM and the maintainer exactly what the work looks like. That's then approved and, and then approved estimate. So we start about, you know, um, just over a year out. So here's a time scale I propose. This allows us to get the engineering strains and stuff booked and the orders booked and the uh, material orders done. We then go out and do the work. So we cost it for the work. So it's to change a bearer do, or change the ballast. We, we give a price for that work. We don't add any risk into it or anything like that. We go and do the work. When the work's being done, we then arrange a completion of work walkout. So we have the maintainer, the root asset manager and ourselves there, and we walk for that work. And we and what we're checking the for is that the work you've asked us to do, i.e. is done to a satisfactory standard. If it is, great. And then basically the contracting company pays for it, and then the maintainer then takes on the that asset going forward. And that, but that basically takes away all that risk, all that expense spent in trying to do a whole asset management plan. So that's just my view of it. I'll put this in the place in Scotland. Uh, it made some massive savings overnight. And um, you, know, you can see it on there. It's all been signed by the asset managers and all that sort of stuff. And they've been absolutely delighted with it. So that's just a proposal. I'm not saying it should be taken on board, but it's what I've made work in Scotland and other people have looked at it. So that's how I would manage refurbishments myself personally. Um, so that's enough of my monotone voice. So thanks for listening and um, more than happy to take any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, we've already had some questions. So um, Andy Franklin, I know you've posted a couple. Would you like to come in and ask your question directly to Nick? Yes, I can do. Yeah, it's uh, Andy Franklin here. A couple of questions. Um, I would can we sort of suggest, and perhaps you can explain how you do it, that we need to have the ability to ramp in and ramp out with the RRVs when you were talking about your list of requirements. Um, well, well, certainly can, Andy. But then I think uh, there, needs, there needs to be a heavy dose of realism here. I'm not trying to be rude. Here. When you yeah. think about a, a, a high output ballast cleaner, it's got a cutter bar which is 450 mil deep. Yeah. And we have to do a dirty great big hole to get that cutter bar in. So mm -hmm. any 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 not notion of actually creating a ramp is lost at that point in time. And to be honest, the, the same applies with uh, cutter bars and suction excavators. Yes, we can do fancy thing like, you know, just take some crib ballast out and slowly ramp ourselves in there. But the, the, the reality of the situation, Andy, it's very hard to, to ramp these bits, bits and pieces in. Yes, with the webs machine, we could start at sleeper bottom and over a period ramp in a little bit, but you're still creating quite a void at the start to get the cover bar in the first place. Yeah. So I, I, I think the, the 
the notion of ramping all this equipment is is it's a nice notion, but it's not a reality. And yes, it should be a usual requirement, but very, very hard in reality to achieve. Yeah, so we, we did achieve it with ballast cleaners at one time, but it was quite an elaborate process to achieve it, I must admit. Uh, yeah, okay. Exactly. And, and, and just to finish on that, Andy, when going back in time a little bit on high output, we was aware of this. We did we did quite a piece of work where we looked at track recording traces where we we had we had cut in and we had tried ramping and there wasn't a, when we looked at the actual track quality there was no real significant impact of the ramp when it came to ballast cleaning. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Andy. You had uh, I think your follow-up question regarding the contour of the uh, of the dig depth. Yes, um, it was really with with the Force One system, which is a um, a vacuum rebal. I'm quite familiar with the vacuum reballasting system, but depth control has been a bit of a challenge with them. Did you do anything more with the Force One system of that, or was it again reliant on the skill of the operator in terms of achieving a good depth control? Is is very much reliant on the skill of the operator, Andy? We have, we have spoken to Force One, and um, bear in mind this is their money, not my money's, and they are going to look at machine control. So you can have a sort of very simple 2D sort of machine control, which is a light bar. So you have a scanning laser and you, you can control the depth that way, but it's still yeah. the same standard operator. You could go to a far more elaborate 3D control system, but then to get a 3D control system, we then need a full topographical survey and control points on site. So, yeah. and then we also looked at things like, you know, we could put depth restrictive on it. So we could put like a trolley on the rails, where actually has a dead stop where it can't go any deeper than that. So we are we are looking at answers, but it is pretty much down to the skill of the operators. Yeah, it is of course very influenced by the texture of the bottom of the dig as well, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. it's a bit like the only way really scrub, it's a bit like your hoover at home. Say you had a pile of sand, as you yeah. as you as you slowly lower down, at some point that sand will shoot up regardless of yeah. what you do. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, David O'Connor, you had a question. Would you like to come in? Hello, yeah, I was just wondering if there's any restrictions in terms of clearances with the Air Force One machine? So, so when you say restriction in clearances, to so what in specific? It's, it's in W6A working gauge. Um, yeah, so it's just there's some machine types of machinery that can't work in platforms or tight clearances because of the swing. But I didn't know if that was applicable with the high, um, Force One machine. Uh, the, the, the tail swing, I'm quite happy to be taking wrong on this, is a, a 360 machine, so it will swing within its own envelope, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. Lovely, thanks. It all depends on what the is. Uh, thank you, David. Um, Brian, Brian Painter, if you are still on. Now, I'm going to read uh, Brian's question then. Um, short um, HO Islands is another potential use for this kit. If we can discuss compaction and consistency of formation depths, I guess this um, one of the question is probably you know looking at the use of of the machines in uh, uh, to do some of the shortfalls. So well, well, I guess well, Nick, from what you explained, plain line is is doable with the machine as well as SNC. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, again, it's it's all. Uh, there's always a question of quality about this. I think high track quality is always going to be driven more towards an undercut system than it is to a, a, a suction activator, just because you can get that graded track there. But absolutely, providing you put the right support and plant around it, we could deal with high output islands in the problem as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark Evel. Mark, are you around? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Joel. Hi, Mark. Nice to hear from you. 
Um, yeah, um, Nick, what it was, was are you developing some method to get the ballast from underneath the sleepers with the Force One? Because it, it seems to be great between the sleepers, but you're going to leave some dirty ballast underneath the sleepers. Yes, Mark. Um, hi, thanks for the question. So, absolutely. So, uh, when you get the um, the slide deck, you have a look at the end of the nozzle. There's there's two little metal bars. Um, we've we've been playing playing tuned with them, to be honest, um, because what we what we're trying to do is, as as the nozzle starts to rotate, they they fling outwards and then they sort of act as a blade to work under the sleepers. Um, so some varying degrees of success, um, what I can say. So we are looking at, um, Force One are looking at a way of um, getting the, those sort of blades that come out underneath the sleepers so they can remove that ballast from underneath the sleepers. But I think it's, um, again, it's it's another consequence of the suction excavators, be it the rail care, be it the tin bin, be it whatever it is. They do struggle to get those sort of pyramids from underneath the sleepers. Uh, and again, it, it, it's this it's this question of quality. If you want to get everything out nice, flat and smooth, the undercut is the way to go. If you just want to try and get some fresh ballast in there, quick and dirty, for want a better phrase, then the suction excavator is probably your, your route. Or, there's, or you could do the other system, what like the Force One guys do, have men in the hole with shovels, actually physically shoveling underneath the bearers to feed the excavator. But again, that, is that a safe practice to be doing? That hopefully that answers your question, Mark. Yes, sorry, yes, that answers the question. Thanks, Nick. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lee Riley. Lee, are you around? Hey, hi, hi, Nick. Long time no uh, speak to. Hi, Mr. Riley. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, my question was about the um, putting the um, ballast back in and the use of manual jacks because that's what you basically do you, you i've used the, the the swedish system quite a few times so you, you you suck it out with lads with basically shovels going underneath the sleepers and you've got a road rail behind putting the ballast in but you've, you've got to manually jack it up and we'll put the jacks in to keep it at the same level as it was before so it's a like for like the rail doesn't move effectively so when we look at the Webby system, it looks like a massive area where the cutter bar is. So um, I was thinking, where do you put the jacks to keep to keep it up? Because it looks like it's doing quite a lot, quite a lot at, at once. See where I'm coming from with, with the jack system. I, I understand what you're saying, Lee. Um, we've done we've done a bit of work and we we looked at deflection of the track. So so when does the track deflect? When the you know how much track will stay pretty much in the air, yeah. Um, and and we, it's, it's about you can open up about eight beds before you get significant deflection, um, probably a little bit more. So what what the thinking is, and it is only thinking, Lee, is as long as we can get the ballast back in. Um, so you look at the webbing web system almost directly behind that cutter bar. The track doesn't deflect that greatly. So you don't need to get the men in with the jacks and stuff like that. And how do we do that? So we either have um, a clamshell working behind, feeding from an engineering train straight in there, or we use some of the more complicated systems, such as the um, the um, Bromberg Cersei Universal Handling Machine, which can basically pump ballast straight in from a, a, a rake of MFSs. So yeah, yeah, it's about a flow of MFSs that you make straight in. Yeah, which adds to your cost, don't get me wrong. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But providing you're getting that ballast back in almost sort of like within that eight bed region, you don't see significant deflection. So oh, you, shouldn't really, you shouldn't really have men in there with jacks. Um, but again, this is one of the problems. I, 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 I don't like saying problems with some of the existing systems because it's been the sounds I've been disparaging. But the rail care system, because it keeps having to drive off discharge and stuff like that, it does tend to leave quite big holes while other work's going on. Oh yeah, but thank you. Nick. That was a good presentation, by the way. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you, Lee. Glad to see you still around. Oh, I right. can't get rid of me, unfortunately. Uh, Kevin Petherall. Kevin. Hi, Nick. Can you hear me? Hi, Kevin. How are you doing? 
I'm doing well. Um, it seems that um, I'm glad you're getting this off the uh, off uh, off base now because it's it's five or six years ago when we started this journey, if you remember. Um, and you've answered the, my second part of the question. Uh, so there's still a problem with, or still a unsolved issue about holding the track up. But it's the um, I remember when we took the vacuum and um, the concept of the uh, undercutter to product acceptance. Um, we had to pull some um, interesting uh, sort of um, uh, stunts to actually get the va vacuum through a product acceptance at that time. And when we then said, well, the undercutter's coming your way soon, hands were thrown up in horror about uh, the undercutter and its potential to um, hurt people. Uh, is, is the product accept and plant accept and process any more benign than it was five years ago, Nick? Uh, I, 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 hi, Kevin. Glad to hear from you, mate. Um, is it any more benign? Um, the answer is no, and it's still the, the right assurance process. There, there's been a big change, though, in their now plant accept and specialist, sort of like the centre yeah. of how the VAB operate. So rather than like the small network rail team, which is always massively under-resourced, having yeah. to go through, go through all the insurance paperwork and stuff like that, and you're basically, um, and the only way they could deal with that was being very much straight down the line, they now realise they didn't have the capacity to do that. So using people like TUV, Ryan Bell, um, I'm actually trying to figure a few off the spot, but, um, I can't figure any other names in the top of my head at the moment in time. You can now go to a, product acceptance specialist who will yeah. manage the insurance process on your behalf. So the rig is still there. You still have to provide all the same documentation and evidence, stuff like that. But there's an independent body who's now contracted to do the paperwork with you. So it's yeah. a far, far more efficient process. And of course, because they're not looking, you are effectively their customer. Let's just say there's a problem with a technical manual. They will tell you what the problem is and help you resolve the problem. So it's a far, far better system. Although equal, they've got equal levels of assurance, it has to. Um, it's a far, far friendlier system to negotiate. Okay. And just if you've got the time for a, a quick uh, additional, um, the issue about getting one uh, firm uh, do, doing uh, sort of all this this pr product development without the promise, is it, is it still the same issue about not being able to go to single source contractors, etc. Uh, yeah, so we, we we don't have guaranteed work banks, uh, as I think most people will recognise on here. And so to get external companies to invest in in the railways is incredibly difficult. And uh, and I'll go hats off to both Andy Webb and um, Force One. They've yeah. developed these pieces of equipment off. Yeah, you know, they've gone to their bank managers and they've totally and utterly funded these. On, on the fact that they they, they have faith in their equipment and it, um, and um, we will use their equipment. But I, I, I'm a great believer in the fact that we should move our business model somewhat and then um, maybe offer some more guaranteed work banks to get some innovation rolling and some really good equipment coming forward because people will invest in equipment if they know they're going to get a return on their money. But presumably the um, refurbishment refurbishment work bank is growing exponentially because um this kit isn't being utilized to the extent it should be well, i think some of my run colleagues can answer that one better than myself Kevin. <laughs> all right thanks nick good stuff you're welcome okay thanks kevin uh dean jones i think you had a question uh, again related to deflection thank you uh, Yes, uh, I, I think it's Dean. Um, just going back to you, uh, you sort of answered it before, but just want some clarification. So if there's minimal deflection over eight beds, was that with or without the undersleeper stool ballast being removed? Yeah, that, that's, with, that's with the ballast excavated, Dean. It's based, so it, it's effectively, imagine it's like a bridge. So it's a yeah, yes. dive wreck, there's nothing in between. So that's where the deflection lies. So the more, and the more you open up, the greater the mass you're trying to support, so the greater the deflection. Yeah, no, no, I understand that. No, thank you very much. I wasn't sure whether the stool was removed from underneath the sleeper as well. So thank you. Yeah, no, it's a, a theoretical empty bed. 
Okay, so uh, Nick, there is no more questions on the chat now. So um, I, I would like to thank you on behalf of everybody for coming and speak to us today. It was a really interesting uh, uh, presentation. Um, you covered a, a lot of ground, and you see that it's good to see that uh, instead of uh, all the, the hurdles on, on money investments, you know, the companies are ready to. Uh, to, to, to get some money to help the industry, you know, find new techniques for, for new oils. And, and you've been a great support of that over the years, Nick. So, um, uh, again, on behalf of everybody, thank you very much. And thank you very much for everybody who attended. And we'll see you on the 4th of November. Okay, Bye-bye.